Uh, Mr. Dutta, my first question is that your knowledge ecosystem, which you know the KM team and Mindtree has developed, you know, you have won the NASCOM Innovation Award. Can you please give us a quick one-on-one on it? So sure. So um, I think the first premise, uh, Alak, is that you know knowledge management is really a lot more about you know taking something which is an evolutionary kind of an ecological approach as opposed to traditionally what's been looked at very process-centric approach. Okay. Okay. So process-centric approach is something which is much more applicable to the industrial age where we came from and less applicable in, uh, I would say, the knowledge era, which is really a little bit more about things you know, sprouting up uh, and evolving. And an ecosystem, by definition, is something which has multiple different types of components in it that are very diverse that together reinforce the fact that there is an ecosystem being created. Right. The ecosystem in turn nurtures those various types of uh, you know, diverse, uh, uh, you know, let's say if you look at rainforest plants or, or you know, species in that. Um, so from our point of view, what does that mean? That means that first of all, you want to think of you know, the equivalent of an ecosystem in, with respect to mm -hmm. the, the knowledge you know, oriented discipline or knowledge organization, what does that mean? Right. And the second thing you want to do is you want to say that, you know, how do you really create this overall environment where uh, the components of film, like, essentially get nurtured? Okay, okay. So, so a little bit more of a nurturing kind of a system. The other essence of it is that, you know, it really is, you know, emergent uh, overall as, as a phenomenon. So it is not something which uh, can be so easily written down and predicted okay. more or less. So. But you essentially create things, what comes out of it generally would be good. So that's essentially the nature of the immersion, uh, you know, the, the immersion phenomenon. So coming back to this then, the knowledge ecosystem, the way we've defined it is first of all, you look at the intent of what you're trying to create. And our intent is defined by our DNA and our class values. Our DNA is imagination, action, and joy. joy. And our class values stand for caring, learning, achieving, sharing, and social responsibility. And social. Now that defines the intent of what we want to do in the organization. And all of this that I'm just talking about, the class values and the DNA, are very, very well aligned with respect to knowledge management. Excellent. Um, now, uh, and that's a, you know, I can, I can prove that to you, <laughs> academically also if necessary. But let's take that as a given that you know, our, our intent is very, very well aligned with knowledge management. So how do you essentially take an intent and make it reality? The reality then within the ecosystem really has to do with a couple of things. One is the constituents of a knowledge organization, a knowledge ecosystem, you know, really are people. Mm -hmm. So first of all, we have to recognize that it has to be something which is people-oriented. Right. So uh, what, is, what does that mean? Well, first of all, people essentially behave in a certain way. What allows them to morph their behavior towards a certain set of defined values is, is really the question. So can we architect whatever we think is the right kind of a thing such that people who exist within that ecosystem mm -hmm. essentially behave aligned to the values. To the values. Yeah. And uh, so the way we looked at it, you know, people actually start behaving in a certain way based on the kinds of, you know, interactions they have. So what do they interact with? They interact with other people. So that's what we call social space. So is it possible for us to create social space in where people interact with other people? Their behavior is morphed and is aligned with the, you know, values that we have. Uh, so that's that social space. Now, from a point of view of social space, we're really talking about face-to-face -face interaction. We're really talking about building trust between people. We're really talking about, uh, you know, conversations, you know, takeaways that people have. That is going to be much more richer in terms of the interaction. We're not talking about online type uh, of interaction. So, so very very important. We consider social space to be very very face-to-face you know, -face kind of interaction or in a very trust-oriented, trust building. Augmenting that is what we call virtual space. The virtual space is what you can think of as social you know, networks online, okay. and, and, and then what goes with it, which is the same Sorry to interrupt you. So initially, you talked about the social space. Right. Right. And now we are talking about the virtual, virtual space. space. Yes. Okay. Okay. So virtual space uh, is then something which really augments. You know, we actually have four different types of spaces we've defined. Okay. So I'm talking about the second one now. All right. Virtual space has become online. It is really then about collaboration between people. So here you essentially end up building relationships, you end up building trust between That's people, you have conversations, you create the more or less the, the social network that is rich and deep. You know, it doesn't get broken so easily if you build relationships, and over that knowledge flows. Now virtual space is meant to then scale this. So how do we allow people, even when they're not face to face, to continue to build on that relationship, continue to have that flow happen more yes, easily yeah. and make it scalable? Um, and over a period of time, the network effect 
takes place using both those social space as well as uh, the virtual the space. space. Now, in the virtual space, we've deployed various types of collaborative systems, okay? Mm -hmm. Through which you, it also aids the process of discovery. You can also discover someone, for example, if you're looking for an expert, uh, or you're basically posting, you know, let's say a question or something of that sort. But it is really a lot more about focus totally on collaboration. So social networking and collaboration, multiple systems exist there. So there's a system that is focused on communities, uh, community portal that's called Connected Minds, and the system that is focused on helping people collaborate and building, you know, innovative software that we call TechWorks in the company. The system itself is called Open Mind. Open Mind. We have another system that is called Project Space, which really is about people collaborating uh, at a project and at an account level within the organization along with the customer. Right. Okay. Uh, we have another collaborative system um, that we call Neuron, mm -hmm. which is focused on the entire life cycle of an idea, from the point of view of inception, where you start thinking of an idea, all the way through deployment of that idea. You know, essentially, it focuses on that. It's an open collective kind of a system where uh, you tap into the collective creativity of people in the company, as well as the collective transformation of ideas uh, within the company. So we've defined, you know, essentially this kind of system that is virtual space. Um, then in addition to that, uh, we have uh, you know, the notion obviously of physical space, which is that whatever's around us. Okay. Um, just so you know, just so I'm clear on this, physical space actually is the responsibility of an admin and facilities function, okay, not, not, uh, not its management <laughs> no, function. Uh, but we have a good, obviously, uh, uh, you know, we, we feed off of each other, so to a certain extent that all credit belongs to them. Uh, where they've created, I think, a very good kind of a physical space, which allows for a lot more interaction between people, for example, to happen. So physical space helps create better social space. Okay. Right? I mean, in that sense. Physical space also, you know, you if the, depending on what you put around in the environment, triggers certain types of behavior in people. So, you know, we have, for example, paintings from, uh, you know, children from the Spastic Society, Society of Karnataka, which yeah. essentially reinforces creativity in people's minds, right? I mean, uh, you know, when you look at that, you you essentially understand that you know the whole hidden message there is that you want to be creative, and also brings in a little bit of fun element into uh, into the whole mix. Uh, so anyway, physical space becomes very important. And then finally, I want to talk about mind space. Now, um, you know, we can do all these other things. Let's say we architect physical space, social space, and uh, virtual space in a certain way uh, that is aligned with the values, and so hopefully we get that behavior. Um, but the last mile problem in knowledge management really is mind space. So if we don't help people become better thinkers overall, okay, in their minds, if we don't allow the melding of minds to happen, you know, with <laughs> more ease, uh, then you know you will have still suboptimal results. Uh, so the last mile problem really becomes in people's mind. And we focus more on the creativity part of it because uh, over the years, you know, we get conditioned to try to essentially be much more logical and rational and we stop being creative that we once were as kids, for as example. Kids. Most of us, not right. all, most of us. So the whole point is that how do we get back to triggering those kinds of you know, possibilities, alternatives, and futuristic kind of thinking, which essentially we lose because we get so caught up in, in the past and today. And so I think it is very, very important to start thinking of that. So the mind, which is a, you know, essentially a, the last mile problem, needs to be very fertile, both from a point of view of you know, how, um, you know, how it's doing in terms of rational thinking, which, you know, you can say hopefully doesn't need as much work, sometimes <laughs> it does, but certainly the creative part needs a lot of work and therefore we have focused uh, a lot on trying to basically bring uh, the creativity levels of people up to various yeah. programs. Um, then if you look at it, all these spaces, these four types of spaces that Basically. we have, essentially reinforce each other. So it, and it, so it's not a linear mechanism, right? It's a non-linear kind of uh, you know system with interdependence amongst them. The constituents, you know, that I said, like our people or systems, you know, they're coexisting, uh, cohabitating, affecting each other. You know, so people affect systems also, right? So so for example, if people want to change something. There is a very very easy way of going to do that. Uh, for example, in communities, we give complete autonomy to the community with respect to the look and feel, with access control, et cetera, et cetera. So our attempt, even with that system level, has been to make the systems, you know, those that can be, you know, uh, those are adaptive that actually can evolve with, with, with some amount of ease. And essentially, of course, you know, get, get constant feedback from people who are in those, uh, in, the, in the ecosystem using them. So by and large, you start looking at this, you start thinking of an ecological approach. So it is, it is a revolutionary ecological approach which is extremely important to think of because knowledge is not something which can be constrained in a little box, uh, you know, and, and um, you know, it is something which is generative, you know, which is open, which is free, which flows very free uh, if you just create those, you know, the right uh, sort of conditions and architectures that company. So 
that's basically what we focused on um, uh, as defining a knowledge ecosystem and mind tree. Excellent, excellent. That sounds great.